Yeah, rescue from caves. I mean, it's never easy. It's never easy. I mean, probably it's, to some extent, it's a bit like the lifeboat men. You know, it's up close and personal. It can be for hours and hours and hours. And in, in a cave, of course, you know, it, it's, you have to contend with cold, darkness, water, and of course, the patients. Uh, sometimes the patients are very helpful. Sometimes you think they're going to die on the spot and they don't. And so there are things like that that occur. I mean, yeah, I mean, cave rescue in caves, uh, particularly in the UK, I mean, they're not as developed as they are in some other countries. I mean, in this country, you know, they tend to be wet and damp and tight. And in fact, people use all sorts of mechanisms in order to explore them. It might not be just as easy to crawl into a cave. There are mechanisms where, in the, certainly in my day, where we used explosives in order to widen the cave. And in fact, they still do to some extent, but it's called capping. Um, so what appears to be um, impassable now becomes possible. The problem is that you make them passable for somebody who's capable, but then if they become incapable because of an injury or something, then it's almost impossible or very difficult to get them out. Um, and so we, used, we had a, a situation at one time where we had a committee, a tight holds committee, um, where we looked at all the caves in the Yorkshire Dales, for example, and decided which were the top of our list and in fact made plans and even pra indeed practiced and located various spots in these caves should it ever occur. So it was the subject of a lot of hard work at one stage in order to, you know, if you like, understand the problems that we would have to get somebody out of these places. Certainly, probably the biggest thing has been um, SRT, single rope technique, where you use devices uh, ordinarily that climbers don't use unless they get into trouble. Cavers are a different bunch altogether. They use ropes, single ropes, to get in and out of caves these days, not ladders anymore. It, when I first started, it was a question of using a ladder. Um, in fact, I certainly remember going down Gaping Gill on a wooden ladder, which we scrapped not long after, and getting down into the main chamber, there were, of course the rope had stretched on the ladders that were holding the wooden rungs together. I got off at the bottom of the ladder and the ladder shot off up into the air, sort of about 15 foot above me. So of course I'm then left with a situation, wait till the next bloke comes down before I can get on it. So in those days the wooden, lad so the wooden ladders disappeared, um, certainly in the sort of mid 60s and along came electron ladders, um, which lasted for quite some time, were very popular. But then, surprise, surprise, along came the technique of abseiling. Um, and the abseiling that most people could remember was probably from people, soldiers in the Second World War and wrapping a rope round the body. Most <laughs> difficult and awkward thing you can imagine is having a rope wrapped round your body and abseiling down it. Whereas now there are devices, the first early devices that I remember for abseiling were what we call bottle openers which, um, I mean, I can't really describe it here easily, but I could show you a photograph or a picture. But I mean, and then it progressed and people then took it on. There were old people trying to suggest that no, that was not caving. In particular in France, there was a guy who was developing equipment called Petzl, and he's now probably a world leader in producing caving equipment, devices for use. And of course, he then branched out into the industrial side of things. So lots of people that you see on television, on films, are wearing some sort of Petzl gear, predominantly a Petzl helmet. You can see that quite often. I've got video clips of us reconstructing how people got themselves into the position they did. I mean, Phil Pappard and I reconstructed for the coroner how a guy came up out of a cave in snow melt water again, up a vertical rope prusikin and came to a 26 inch knot. Now he shouldn't have had a 26 inch knot in front of him, it shouldn't have been like that, he should have been able to get past it. And in fact we demonstrated, I demonstrated that you could get past it, but of course I wasn't then hanging in snow melt water. 
um, like this chap had been. And of course, we showed the coroner how it should have been set up. So there are lots of little things like that we've done in order to be able to demonstrate, you know, the capability. I mean, you know, one guy got washed away in a cave and in fact, the holes in his tattle bag, which weren't, he had no holes in the tattle bag. So he had a tattle bag full of water trying to climb up a ladder. So you imagine another 65 pounds of weight hanging from your waist. And there you are trying to drag yourself out there. And eventually he couldn't, he fell off and drowned. But had he had suitable holes in the bottom of the tattle bag, manufactured for the purpose, the water would have drained out and one would think that he could have climbed out. So there's lots of little instances. I think I talked earlier about the polypropylene rope, but I mean, it was just the wrong rope in the wrong place. I mean, they'd gone along, dare I say, and bought the rope from, um, from a supplier who should probably have known better. Have, maybe they should have said what they were proposing to use it for. But in, 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 in reflection and after the inquest and the investigation, uh, about the rope, I mean, they were, um, you know, it, it melted, it literally, as the guy abseiled down, his descender got hot, and the rope melted, uh, just in, inadequate for the purpose. Um, Colin Green was very unfortunate, he was a teacher at Bentham Grammar School and took a bunch of kids, well, kids, young men, from his grammar school, caving one morning into Kingsdale Master Cave, not long after we'd actually found it. Maybe, I can't remember the exact date now, but it was certainly in the, uh, it would be in the sort of late, um, late 60s. Um, and the belay, the wire belay that it was using for the rope, for the ladder, had a hemp core, uh, core holding all the, all the wires out together. Um, and the hemp core uh, had actually rotted and so all these wires managed to sort of make contact with one another and became uh, work hardened if you like and snapped and so the whole thing just snapped and he fell more or less 15 20 feet onto his back uh, as a result he was a permanent paraplegic Well, the changes, I mean, the fundamental changes to the cave rescue organisation, I guess, have been certainly from my time when I first got involved. We had a garage next door which belonged to the pub. The guy who was a publican, a guy called Jack Holland, was very supportive. He was the uh, new in publican. He helped us, he let us park a vehicle in, in there eventually when the brewery decided to sell we were fortunate to be able to buy the whole building and the one adjacent to it which belonged to one of the caving clubs at that time um, we bought the whole lot for about ten thousand pounds in 19 i can't remember 1970s late 70s um, and we've been here ever since i mean it's uh, it, it's certainly befitting an organization of our size um, we obviously make changes wherever it's necessary. Um, I suppose the biggest change has been communications. I mean, after the members in any rescue team, uh, I would suggest that after, after the members, the most important thing is communications. Now, somebody would say, oh, hang on a minute, what about the patient? Well, yeah, the patient, when, when there's an incident, probably the most important person's the, the patient. But the rest of the time, and that's 95% of the time, it's all to do with the organisation, members and communications. And communication is, is a vast subject you could spend your day. I mean, we have a unique situation in CRO compared to other organisations where we have got to be able to communicate, particularly underground. Um, over the years, we've been able to transmit uh, information through solid rock through all sorts of clever devices uh, you know there's nothing more simple than being able to just shout at somebody if you like and shouting in underground is quite good because it's uh, it's acoustic um, that's the simplest method I mean we've lots of other methods using radios up and down pitches these days um, you know using devices through solid rock over big distances and so on um, and of course 
we've got the communication system of radios which is setting to none which we use not only just to communicate on incidents to communicate the membership and I'm able to unlike everybody else is able to sort of just send a simple text message that comes into the depot and pops up on the computer here so they know who's available where they are when they come in and all the rest of it so quite quickly you've got a list of things which the duty controller is able to look at so it's, it's changed tremendously I think the biggest problem that CRO have had over the years is that you've got a lot of people come from all sorts of disciplines and you throw them all together in, in an environment that's not if you like professional in that sense um, and so from time to time it's not been easy you've had engineers window cleaners plumbers you know joiners you name it every walk of life teachers every walk of life you can imagine and you're throwing all these guys together uh, and, and and women of course um, throwing them all together into an environment into a stressful environment um, that they eventually will become used to but certainly you know it's it's not easy well, help from outside sources like MPs and people like that. I mean, from time to time, I'm sure they mean well. Um, and, and in fact, we're quite happy, if you like, or thankful is probably the right word, for any help that we can get. Um, you know, you always have to wonder about MPs exactly because it's the flavour of the month and they came out of the woodwork when there'd been a big incident. They got to be seen to be saying something. Um, I mean, we've looked after ourselves to a large extent. I mean, yes, we've had offers from people like MPs. You do wonder whether it's political rather than whether they really mean it. Um, it's, it's not something that, uh, you know, you think about too much, to be quite honest with you. I mean, we latterly, in this last few years, we seem to be able to, um, how can I say, finance ourselves thankfully due to people who are extremely grateful often people who can at least afford it seem to be more grateful than people that can but uh, you know in terms of funds i think most rescue teams are doing fairly well in terms of income <laughs>